I mean, it's fucked up. Yes. In, in, this, in situations like these, all we could do, like, is learn. Learn from, you know, the mistakes that people make and better yourself and let them live through you. Right. All you could do is learn. I hate a month, like, oh, he just dies. We got to pull up some tumbling family. Mm. You're going to end up the same, you know what I'm saying, the same situation. Like, my just got to learn from the mistakes, like the fatal mistakes that people make. Because... I mean, who wants to have another casualty? Right. <laughs> Rapper Juice World is dead. The 21-year-old who was named Billboard's best new artist this year suffered a medical emergency at Chicago's Midway Airport. So many questions as to how a seemingly healthy 21-year-old could die so unexpectedly. I seriously seen an issue and I was hoping it would get addressed. So the, these drugs, whether it's uh, lean or you know, general painkillers, perks, all these sorts of things are, are severely, severely dangerous. You can be here one second and then you can be gone the next, man. Like I can't see someone so young and so beautiful and so smart and talented pass like that. It is so sad. On the 8th of December 2019, Jared Anthony Higgins, more commonly known as Juice World, was pronounced dead. This is his legacy. I would listen to just, just cramming my head with it, not really giving a fuck about school or homework or, or really anything else besides music, you know, like just that's all I cared about. So, Jared was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. His parents split up at an early age, and whilst he remained in contact with his father, they rarely saw each other. Juice described his mother as a hardcore Christian, and she even banned rap music from the house while he was growing up, and she thought it could have a bad influence on Jared. This meant growing up, he mostly listened to pop and rock music that he had heard on video games such as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. That was until he started having a crush on a girl at school and in an attempt to impress her, started to listen to the music she liked. This introduced him to his initial musical influences such as Panic at the Disco, Fall Out Boy and Blink-182. It wasn't until Jared's brother and cousins introduced him to artists such as Chief Keef, Gucci Mane and Future that he would start gaining a real interest in rap music. Now I'm at it, making ass and rap back that. Don't believe me, you can pop like a blackhead. I spit heat fast like a crackhead. Thinking that you want it, but you don't know this. Focus, now I got ADD, now I'm swarming like locusts. Who is this? Making hand signs like you're deaf or something. That's okay, I'll be on the beat. Spinning fast like Crystal Left or something. Really, it's nothing. Making assumptions, it's nothing. Make you won't put you in the oven for no reason or something. I'm the best at it. Yes, I'm the best at it. I got some Even with his mother's imposed rap ban, hip hop's pull and Jared was just too strong. He began creating music in his freshman year of high school, but musically was active before then, teaching himself how to play the piano and guitar when he was younger through YouTube tutorials. He began taking music seriously around 2015 when he was 16, after being told by his friends he was good enough to become a real rapper. He uploaded his first song titled Forever to SoundCloud that same year under the alias Juice of the Kid. It was also around this time that him and his friends would start experimenting with drugs. However, Whilst Jared's peers were smoking weed, he was taking Percocet and Xanax. I would tell myself to stay as far away from drugs as possible. Um, so I think the main advice I give myself is just to not give up and keep, keep striving and stay sober. <laughs> Jared's adoration and obsession with music and in particular artists like Future and Gucci Mane would play a big role in his success. But they also contributed to his everlasting troubles with drug addiction. So my family putting me on to all this different music, Future, Gucci, all these niggas talking about drugs. Bro. You can't help but ignore how fun or how interesting at least they're making Zans and Lean and all and the lean, shit sounds. Yeah, bro. Like when I heard Future, the first song I ever heard by Future was Ain't No Way Around It. The second song I've <clears> ever heard by Future is... Um, Dirty Sprite, like the, for off the first Dirty Sprite mixtape. Mm -hmm. And that shit had me wanting to sip lean at like 11, 12 years old, bro. Yeah. So, you know, I ain't know if that was what I was really finna be doing, but. 
Although that's where his desire to experiment with drugs started, it was mostly Xanax that a young Gerald would use to chase a high. I used to fuck with Perks Heavy too, but it was Xanax that was that was what did it. But it's like, we, me and the homies was doing that shit before it was cool. Like, before Future was rapping about it, before he was telling my fuckers to pop 56 in. You know what I'm saying? Like, before shit was a trend, we was doing that shit because I think that was like my first streak of being different. Everybody was smoking weed. They used to look at us like we were like crackheads. Like, bro, y'all taking Zans? Y'all popping pills? What the fuck is wrong with y'all? The same niggas two years later hitting my phone asking me where they at. <laughs> this is the funny part. Juice grew dependent on prescription drugs to deal with his depression. His ex-girlfriend was quoted saying, even when he had every reason to be happy, he still wasn't, and that's obviously a mental illness. She spoke some more on his relationship with drugs, as his fame and music career grew, saying that she believed he would take up to three 30 milligram Percocet at a time, whilst drinking lean. Whilst many artists turned to drugs post-fame, Juice's relationship with drugs started way before then, and he described it as a gift and a curse. Whilst they can and will ruin your life if the addiction becomes too much, drugs helped his creative process, allowing him to feel emotions that a sober mindset couldn't potentially helping create his breakthrough hit, All Girls Are The Same. The music video to the Heartbreak Anthem was uploaded to the Lyrical Lemonade YouTube channel on the 25th of February 2018 and would change Juice World's life forever. The song came along at the perfect time as Lyrical Lemonade was really starting to take off and becoming the go-to platform for aspiring hip-hop artists. This was the beginning of a long-running creative relationship between Juice and Cole Bennett, which would also turn into a close friendship. For me, this is my favourite Juice World song. From the poetic writing to the hard-hitting beat, which is also complemented with the light, soft melody, the song goes against a stereotypical hip-hop artist's braggadocious attitude claiming they could have any girl they want, which I feel is why the song stood out in the way that it did. Whilst the song certainly brought Juice to the attention of many, gaining half a million views after the first two days, it was a song that he had released nearly a year prior that would catapult Juice World into mainstream stardom. The riddance here with the song Lucid Dreams, Juice World. <laughs> The song was first released in June 2017 on Juice World's SoundCloud page and started to gain traction after the success of All Girls Are The Same and would go on to peak at number 2 on the Billboard Hot 100. Much like All Girls Are The Same, the song is about a troubling relationship and produced by the same person, Nick Mira. I met Juice by my, uh, my homeboy DT aka Sidepiece around uh, say like two years ago. He, uh, he was on Twitter, he met him, he's like, yo, I, f I found this kid, he's from Chicago, he's got like 300 SoundCloud followers, he sounds dope, we should start working with him. Ever since then, we've just been sending him stuff, and he's just been knocking out hits. When creating the beat, he sampled Sting's Shape of My Heart. And whilst sounding amazing and contributing to the emo rapper's biggest hit, the use of the sample would be very costly. So Sting, Sting was even saying that the He's gonna, the, the royalties from that song are going to be paying his, his grandkids college tuition. Yeah, she wanted to say the royalties from that song are going to be paying his grandkids college tuition. I bet. <laughs> Motherfucker, that's some shit. Sting, shout out Sting, that's a gut right there. Uh, are you familiar with Lucid Dreams? Of course I am, From yeah. Juice World, and what are your thoughts on I, that song? I, lo I love that version. I mean, Sting described the song as a beautiful interpretation that is faithful to the song's original form. So faithful, in fact, that Sting would take 85% of the earnings Lucid Dreams made. Nick Mira, appearing to be riled up, tweeted about his outrage over the situation. Juice, however, appeared less faced. This wasn't the last of the song's legal issues, though. In October 2019, broken up pop punk group Yellow Card opened up a lawsuit against Juice World, seeking $15 million in damages and co ownership of the song, as they believed Juice stole their melody from the song Hollywood Died. For me, the resemblance is debatable, but take a listen for yourself. I 
I can definitely hear an overlap in the first half of the melody, but not so much in the second. I struggle to see it being close enough for a lawsuit. The pop punk band continued pursuing the lawsuit until April of 2020, and it's now currently on hold due to the global pandemic. You know Despite all of its legal issues, I think when we look back on this generation of SoundCloud artists, Lucid Dreams will be considered a classic. The record went on to become one of the defining songs of the decade, spending 48 weeks on the chart and sitting on over half a billion views on YouTube. So of course, it went on to become one of the leading singles to his debut album, Goodbye and Good Riddance. Released on the 23rd of May 2018, the album peaked at number 4 on the Billboard 200 and only had one feature which appeared on the track Wasted with Lil Uzi Vert. Highlights from the album, apart from the obvious two, were Black and White, Candles, I'm Still and Lean With Me. The album received mixed reviews from critics but the fans loved it as the music felt raw, personal and relatable. I like to make people happy, I like to like create connections with music and, you know, vibes and bring people together. I'm not necessarily the most joyful person in the world, but that's one thing that does make me happy, making music. A month later in June, XXXTentacion tragically passed away in a botched robbery, and the November prior, another emo rap pioneer, Lil Peep, had sadly passed away due to a drug overdose. Both incidents deeply affected Juice, and he wrote a song in tribute to the deceased artists titled Legends. I usually have an answer to the question, but this time I'm gonna be quiet. Sing it! This time, sing it, sing it! Ain't I here like the feeling of uncertainty, the eeriness of silence? Yeah, yeah. This time it was so unexpected. Yeah. Last time it was the drugs and the legends. Yeah. All legends fall in the game. Okay. Legends would eventually go platinum, and Juice wasn't slowing down there. In October that same year, he collaborated with one of his idols, Future, to release the mixtape World on Drugs. The title was very appropriate at the time, with some taking it as a reference to the current state of hip-hop, with Mac Miller passing away because of an overdose the month before. The project debuted at number two, behind the soundtrack to A Star Is Born, and they claimed the whole thing was recorded in a week. Both artists were known in the industry for their ability to relentlessly make song after song, and Juice in particular became renowned for his ability to freestyle. I had never seen anything like it. Like, he's the first person I ever worked with musically that just literally he made songs in one take, like he didn't stop. And then he would do it four times, and then he'd pick from each one, like without stopping a song, and then he'd create a song in the shortest time frame I've ever seen, it was crazy, yeah. That kid was so talented, man. He, like his, his freestyle he did on Westwood where he rapped for an hour, what the fuck? YouTube.com slash Tim Westwood TV. Yo, it's Tim Westwood TV up at Capital Extra. Make sure you subscribe to the channel because right now we're about to go in so legendary. We're going to shut the city down, baby. Let's set the tone. Juice yeah. World. Uh -oh. Let's go. Juice World surprised a lot of people in the industry when he freestyled for an hour straight on the Tim Westwood show with a lot of old heads in hip hop presuming he was just another one of those SoundCloud rappers, but he was much more. People like perceive an artist like him and think he can't rap because he sings and has melody and that wasn't bad. He rapped over um, False Prophets, right? Um, salute to Juice World. I, I, I grade him uh, an A on that. A few months after his initial one hour freestyle on the Tim Westwood show, Juice went back and did it again but this time exclusively over Eminem Beats, who was a big inspiration for Juice growing up. R.I.P. to X, R.I.P. to Peep, R.I.P. to Mac, R.I.P. to Beats, R.I.P. to anybody that want beef, R.I.P. to anybody that want beef, R.I.P. to all the niggas died in the street, R.I.P. to all the niggas died, rest in peace. The only thing I can't say is R.I.P. me, cause I'ma live forever, I put that on my life, B. Juice would carry on showcasing his special talent on various platforms, and according to Juice, every song on his sophomore album, Death Race for Love, was freestyled. He recorded the entire album over three days. 23 songs over 72 hours. 
The freestyle element of the album was most evident on the track Feeling, where there was a mistake during the song which they decided to leave in. The freestyle nature of the project resulted in a variety of sounds from a dancehall vibe on Hear Me Calling to something close to country on Floors and Sins. But of course, he stayed true to his familiar emo rap sound throughout the album, in particular with his lead single, Robbery. He had produced yet again another heartbreak hit with the song climbing the charts again. However, whilst the heartbreak he referenced on Goodbye and Good Riddance was how he was feeling in the moment, when he was recording this album, his girlfriend was there with him in the studio day and night and was due to put an end to his girl problems. Y'all wanna know how a love story is supposed to end? Talk to him, Juice! Okay. Talk to him! Well, I can't find friends Ali Lottie is an Instagram influencer with now over a million followers and started dating Juice World in late 2018. The two were more or less inseparable as she would attend recording sessions and join Juice on tour. Imagine a breath of fresh air, but at the same time somebody to take your breath away. It's not really no feeling like that out there, so no drug ever make me feel like that. No, nobody besides this individual right here. Later on in 2019, Juice would release yet another hit featuring NBA young boy titled Bandit, linking up with Cole Bennett once again for the music video. Everything was starting to come together for Juice World. He had found a girl he loved and his music career was thriving more than ever. Collaborating with artists such as Ellie Goulding, Halsey and BTS, Juice World was a bona fide superstar, helping pioneer a new wave of music. But then, on the morning of December 8th, 2019, his life was cut desperately short. Inside the Atlantic uh, um, Airport, they've got a guy seizuring in here. 6 days after his 21st birthday, Jared and his friends were travelling to Chicago on a private jet to celebrate. The pilot of the plane had noticed that they were carrying a variety of narcotics and guns and as a result, alerted law enforcement authorities. Whilst on the flight, members of Juice's management team claimed they saw the rapper taking multiple unknown pills. The police were waiting for the flight to land so that they could search the plane. As they were searching the luggage, Jared swallowed several pills of Percocet in an attempt to hide evidence. He started convulsing, seizing up and bleeding from the mouth. Attempting to save his life, he was transported to the nearest hospital where he was pronounced dead. The autopsy report showed it was due to a toxic level of Percocet and codeine in his system. time that he had shown me any different love that he felt for you like he wants everyone to know that you need to take any negative any negative thing in your life he would tell you every time he saw you and change that to a positive situation he changed that to 999 
you gotta keep that in your heart. Can everyone say 999? Thank you. Make some noise for Allie one time. If you love Juice World again, put two fingers back up right now, put them up high. Play it. Fortunately, before his death, Juice was able to collaborate with one of his idols, Eminem, for the track Godzilla. This was his first posthumous appearance and the song actually reached the number one spot in the UK. The music video was directed by, of course, Cole Bennett, who was able to pay tribute to Juice by creating one of the standout music videos of the year. Since then, there has been a number of other posthumous features from Juice such as PTSD, Suicidal and No Miami. His latest posthumous release was his own song titled Righteous that he had recorded in his home studio in LA. Juice's mum released the song along with the announcement that she'd be starting the Live Free 999 fund. The song itself is a tough listen. We may die this evening, coughing, we seem bleeding. One of the saddest things looking back at the death of Juice World is this sense of inevitability. Of course, there's the obvious theme of his drug problem throughout his discography, but there's some things in particular that feel more haunting. Weeks before his death, a prank started to become a trend on TikTok, where Juice's hit song Lucid Dreams would play, and at a certain point in the music, it would sound like a broken record replaying the same fraction of a second repeatedly. When it got to that point in the song, whoever is doing the challenge would pretend to have a seizure. These lucid dreams where I can a trending internet challenge acting out the exact way Juice World died, Two Way Juice World's song would be weird enough on its own, but on a freestyle before he was famous, he raps the following line. I pop a Percocet, the perfect shit I'm overdosing. On his tribute track to X and Peep Legends, he said this. And to top it all off, he died the same day as John Lennon, who he mentioned on his breakthrough hit. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to start any conspiracy theories and I'm sure it's all just coincidence, but it just emphasises this feeling that the tragedy was inevitable. I would say the, like once I saw Juice record in, in Sydney the first time, um, I would say I definitely went back and was like, okay, I want to try this. And I, and that's how I record now. Really? I don't, I don't do it how he does it, but you know, I, I, uh, the way like just off the top and punching in for sure, that definitely, um, influenced me. And, and the other thing that I took away was, uh, really getting in touch with your emotions when making a song. That's mm. one thing that I feel like he did, that he did perfectly. Um, On a musical level, Juice's legacy can already be seen in up-and-coming Australian artist The Kid Leroy. The young rapper signed to the same label as Juice in 2019 at the age of 15. Juice World became a mentor for Leroy and took him on the Australian leg of his Death Race for Love tour. I've not felt this excited for a rising artist since Juice World, and with the help of Lyrical Lemonade, he looks well on course to become hip-hop's next star. That was my big brother. That was, um... Yeah, he was a great guy. We got some shit together. Um, yeah, I mean, shit, it's a tragedy, but I know he's up there guiding me and making sure everything's good. So, yeah, rest in peace, and I'm gonna make sure his legacy never dies, for sure. Whilst Juice World's imprint on the music industry will have a lasting impact, I hope his death will transcend that. The US has been suffering with an opioid addiction crisis, with data in 2018 showing that every day 128 people die as a result of an opiate overdose. It's a topic that seemingly swept under the carpet, with big pharmaceutical companies profiting from the millions of people that suffer with the addiction. The opening of the Live Free 999 fund is a symbol of what Juice WRLD tried to do with his music which has normalised the conversation around drug addiction, depression and anxiety and I hope that people can learn from his mistakes before it's too late and we lose another special talent too soon. You can do whatever the fuck you want to do in this life. Remember that 
And I know it sounds cliche, but that's some real shit. And I can't tell you that enough because I accomplished that. Like, I wasn't shit two years ago. Like, I had probably, I was getting like 5,000, 10,000 plays on SoundCloud, and that used to make me piss myself. So, like, me going from that to shit several, like, you know, several times platinum, number one art, like a bunch, all these accolades and awards and titles and shit. Nigga, less, really less than two years ago, I had less than, like, I had less than 2,000 followers on Instagram, bro. Now I got, like, 7 million followers. Like, what the fuck? This shit is possible. This is possible. This is very possible. Um... And you could do it. I hope I'm. I hope somebody in here, or more. I hope several people in here that's listening to me, whoever listening to me. I hope that y'all accomplish what I'm like. Whatever y'all want to do, I hope y'all are greater than me. If y'all want to do music, I hope y'all are greater than me. Like I hope y'all do way better than I ever do. Like, yeah. Real shit. Real rap, no cap. All along, fight. On my own And that is the life, death and legacy of Juice World. I've been Scott. Thank you for watching.